Good morning. I'm Nava Kaplan. I'm a past president of the Candidate Council, and I'm here to introduce you to our newest committee, the Candidate Council Master Teacher Award. This committee was born over two years of a lot of work, and we finally bring it to fruition with our inaugural session today. I'm going to introduce you to our committee chair, Valerie Golden, and she'll take over. Valerie. Thank you, Nava. <clears throat> I'm Valerie Golden. I'm the chair of the Master Teacher Award Committee of the Candidates Council, and I'm the new president-elect of the Candidates Council. It is my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Robert Michaels, who is our inaugural recipient of the Master Candidates Council Master Teacher Award. Dr. Michaels is a Walsh McDermott University professor of medicine and psychiatry at Weill Medical College of Cornell University and training and supervising analyst at the Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. He is also deputy editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry and former joint editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. He served as the Stephen and Suzanne Weiss Dean of Cornell University Medical College and Provost for Medical Affairs of Cornell University from 1991 to 1996, and as the Barclay McKee Henry Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Cornell University Medical College, and Psychiatrist-in-Chief of the New York Hospital, Payne Whitney Clinic, and Westchester Division from 1974 to 1991. The Master Teacher Award, just to give you a little background, um, arose out of many years of, of work, as Dr. Kaplan has said, um, but it arose from the conviction that we were all brought to psychoanalysis by someone who taught us and not only inspired us, but inspired us in a way that was life-changing. And we wanted to recognize that it is the first and only candidate-driven award for, for teaching. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to have Dr. Michaels be our inaugural recipient as he truly manifests what we mean by master teacher. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Things all, aren't always what they might seem to be. That's one of the tenets of our profession. So you've just been read a terrifying statement about what'll happen if you say a word outside this room while we're being videotaped. <laughs> Fortunately, we have the warning on the tape so it can be included to the many audiences that will be viewing this tape. Um, I was immensely honored and gratified when I was told that I'd received this award. Uh, I like to teach. I narcissistically, arrogantly, grandiosely pride myself as being a good teacher. And I thought, this is just wonderful. Then, being a psychoanalyst, I had some second thoughts about what else it might mean. First, it occurred to me that very few of you in the room or in the organization have ever been students of mine. So how did you know what kind of teacher I am? <laughs> that worried me a little bit. Then I thought back and remembered that there had long been a speaker who was a visiting senior analyst to this group early on Saturday morning. Then I had a fantasy. This is pretty early in the morning for me. I don't know about you. I live in New York, so I had to come from home. I'm not in the hotel. And then I was told that I had to be here at 7.15 to make sure the microphone worked and stuff like that. And then I realized what must have happened, the other meaning. I was enjoying the thought that you all thought I was a master educator, but somebody figured out after getting 14 refusals for a 7.30 appearance by a senior <laughs> analyst, I have an idea, let's make it an award. <laughs> so somebody with an Apple computer prepared a certificate of award. <laughs> And 
I didn't think 7.30 in the morning, I don't want to get up. I thought, what an honor, this is wonderful. I can put it on my CV, I may be able to finally get a good job. <laughs> so, but I'm, uh, as we understand, I was able to maintain both streams of thought. It is a great honor. And I understand you need a speaker without an honorarium, and this is one way to arrange it. And I accept, <laughs> and I accept that. Then, of course, I had to think about what I was going to speak about. And it seemed to me it should have something to do with teaching. That's what the topic is. And I was wondering, thinking to myself, what kind of teaching is uh, unique to psychoanalysis? And I think, really, the honest answer is probably nothing is unique. Everything has an antecedent history and a background. And I'll talk about that as we go on. But probably the most unique component of psychoanalytic education is supervision. We have didactic programs and curricula, but if you've gotten this far in your career, this is the hundredth didactic program you've been involved with, and you've taken courses and seminars and heard lectures and been taught before. We have something that either is a unique component or it's not a component at all. That's a big debate these days, actually, which is the analysis. Is the training analysis a central part of psychoanalytic education? Or does it have nothing at all to do with psychoanalytic education? And I'll talk about that as a little bit later. But the part that's unequivocally part of psychoanalytic education and fairly different, not unique, but fairly different than any earlier educational experience is what we call supervision. My next thought was, there's been a fair amount written about supervision, how to supervise and principles of supervision. There are books on it, there are lots of articles on it, there have been panels on it. And anyway, most of you are not yet primarily supervisors, I presume. I presume you're more cathected, to use an old-fashioned word, to the role of being a supervisee. And that's a difficult, tricky role that often isn't attended to adequately, because the supervisor has to take care of the supervisee. But the supervisee has to take care of the supervisor. And supervisors are, in general, older, more rigid, more stubborn, more fixed in their ways, more dogmatic, and more difficult to take care of. And frequently, supervisees deny that that's a task. They say, well, I have nothing to do with this. I just have to be, I have to experience it, like the flu or something like that. But, <laughs> but I think there's, there are things that can be done as a supervisee that enhance the supervisory experience. And I thought maybe that would be an interesting thing to talk about. So the real working subtitle of what I'm saying is how to be a supervisee, or how to be the best possible supervisee. Or maybe better, how to be the happiest supervisee, which may be the critical variable. And I thought I would think about that. Um, that required my thinking back to my supervisee days. But then I realized I'm not really thinking back to them because I'm still in supervision. I think you'll find that most of us who are reasonably successful at our careers are in supervision for our entire careers in one way or another. I, at the moment, have more supervisors than patients. Sometimes that happens when you're a candidate and it's awkward. Have any of you ever presented the same case to two or more supervisors simultaneously? Did you let them know about it or keep it secret? <laughs> um, no, I think it came up. <laughs> it came up. <That's laughs> I'll let you all infer what that means. <laughs> um, I've been in that situation on both ends. Uh, I'm now... Um, uh, old enough so I no longer would start a patient in analysis because the average length of an analysis and my life expectancy are too close to each other. But I have groups that I participate in at the moment, three different ones of colleagues, peers, who meet regularly and discuss cases or experiences or whatever in a self-supervisory group. And they're amongst the high points of my current professional and personal life. They become friends. Um, I have three such groups. One meets in my home city, a few blocks from here. Uh, one meets in Princeton twice a year, which has the advantage of having 
members each from a different city, so there's a little less concern about confidentiality and exposure. And one meets alternately each year, one year in Paris, one year in New York, and there are advantages to that that I won't burden you with. But <laughs> if you have to go to Paris every other year for a group, you have to go. That's all there is to it. <laughs> uh, but I'm involved in all of those and enjoy all of them. And so it's really, it's not an event in your training. It's a theme in your professional career that starts early and continues throughout. So I'll be thinking about that as I talk. Um, I don't like to read papers because my voice uh, loses whatever engaging quality it might otherwise have and I begin to feel bored, which I'm sure is only a signal for what you all feel. So I, that's all before the paper. I have a paper. But in keeping with that, I would invite you, I'd much rather have the discussion webbed into the paper than me talk for an hour and then you ask seven questions. So feel free to uh, say something, interrupt, make a comment, argue with me, agree with me as I'm speaking. Um, I know that when you say that at the beginning, um, no one ever does it. So I've made special arrangements with the candidates council. I know the president and the ex-president. And you'll get an extra CME credit, the first person who <laughs> speaks up from the audience. So if any of you want to get that, this is your chance. The Care and Feeding of Supervisors, a user's guide for supervisees. I'll discuss how to be a successful supervisee. Most of the literature is how to supervise, advice for supervisors on dealing with supervisees. I'll be talking about how to be supervised, advice for supervisees on dealing with supervisors. I'll start by quoting one of the great figures in our field. Is there anyone here from San Francisco? Nobody. Well, an analyst died of just a few weeks ago in San Francisco, a good friend, wonderful man, Bob Wallerstein. You may have heard of him. He wrote a great deal. He was president at various times of this organization, the American Psychoanalytic, and the International Psychoanalytic. He was a good teacher, well known for his teaching skill. And he um, edited one of the classic works in the field about supervision. It's a, bo a, a book of collected papers called Becoming a Psychoanalyst. Any of you ever seen it? It's sort of old now. It's worth taking a look at. It's the report of a COPE group, an American Psychoanalytic Committee on Psychoanalytic Education group that was brought together with leading people in the field to study supervision several decades ago. And the group worked by deciding to focus on a single supervision in detail. And even most of the book is about a single session in that supervisory experience, the fifth session, whatever that might mean. And it was quite controversial. It led almost to lawsuits because it's all public, it's in the book. The supervisee was a distinguished colleague of ours, probably at this, speaks frequently at our meetings, Howard Chevron now in Ann Arbor. And the supervisor was Herb Schlesinger, a distinguished colleague of ours who's written about supervision, who's now in New York City. And they're both esteemed members of the profession. And Schlesinger was supervising um, Chevron on Chevron's, I think, first training case. And the entire years of COPE meetings focused on understanding this supervisory hour as a as a, a exemplar of this supervisory process, the first 12 sessions I think they had in total. But Schlesinger never told Chevron they were doing this. And Chevron didn't know about it till the book was ready to be published. In which case they sent Chevron a copy of the book and asked him to comment on it. And he exploded with rage. Chevron, a distinguished researcher, said you didn't get informed consent. What is this? Also, he said, Schlesinger got me all wrong. <laughs> what he thought was going on isn't what was really going on. Of course, really is a trick word in psychoanalysis. But anyway, there was a huge brouhaha about it. It ended up with their bringing in a peacemaking analyst to negotiate and mediate between Chevron and Schlesinger. And the book, as it came out, has two chapters written by Chevron explaining why Schlesinger got it wrong, <laughs> which is fun. 
and I recommend it. It's, it's interesting reading. Um, but there is a, Bob Wallerstein uh, was the secretary of the group and really wrote the report and is the, uh, put together the uh, edited book, wrote several chapters himself and summarized the themes of it. And Wallerstein, if you've read of his other writing, is a marvelous summarizer and organizer and you know, you can, you can sort of babble incoherently for an hour and then if you read Wallerstein's notes, it sounds like you were highly organized and said something meaningful until you realize he wrote them before you spoke. <laughs> But there's a sentence in it that caught my eye and I wanted to start this talk with, partly in honor. Bob just died a few weeks ago. He said, the flexible student can adapt to the teacher's style, can learn from each, even those least congenial to him. Old days, he could get away with the him still. We'd have to say him or her now can adapt to a range from the most directly authoritarian to the most permissively democratic. Wallerstein's point is, the good supervisee knows how to turn any supervisor into a good supervisor. And just as the supervisor's job is to turn the supervisee into a good analyst, the supervisee's job is to turn the supervisor into a good supervisor. In my experience at both ends, it's fairly easy to turn any supervisor into a bad supervisor. But the principle is the supervisee has influence. And so the corollary is a supervisee can turn any supervisor into a good supervisor. In fact, I've seen many situations where a supervisee who was more talented or gifted than the supervisor was able to make it a good supervisory experience by carefully finding out what the supervisor did know and then focusing the supervision on that process. If you have a teacher, as all teachers, who is narrowly focused on some skill or ability, make sure you learn that during the supervision rather than spend all your time proving how stupid the supervisor is on every other area of the field. That's a common problem in supervision. Psychoanalytic education. The so-called Eitingen model of psychoanalytic education, which is the model used, I don't know what happened this week, but until this week by every American Psychoanalytic Association Institute. Did we admit the white this week? We did. So it's no longer the model used by every institute, because the white doesn't use it, but every other institute uses it. It's based on three pillars of psychoanalytic education, which you're all familiar with. I've mentioned them earlier, the didactic courses, the personal analysis, and the supervision. Oddly enough, the most essential pillar, the fourth, isn't mentioned. No one says a word about it. The thing you must do to become a psychoanalyst is to conduct psychoanalyses, to be an analyst, a student analyst. It isn't even mentioned, it's so obvious it isn't mentioned. It's like saying in order to really learn to swim, you have to learn to breathe, and, but you have to go in the pool. <laughs> in order to learn to be an analyst, you gotta sit behind a couch. Anyone who's reached this level of psychoanalytic candidacy has had considerable experience with didactic courses, starting with first grade, if not these days earlier. There's much to know about how best to teach and how best to learn. Years ago, my institute had, re had a retreat about supervision. And we went to a nice place and had too much to drink and presented various seminars. And a gifted analyst in the group, Sharon Ornstein, some of you may know her, gave a talk about her experience as a student and supervisee. And the high point of the whole weekend, the one at the line I remember, was she told a story about her then six or seven year old son. She discussed with him that she was gonna be writing a paper about this and asked him about his experiences as a student and a teacher. And he said, well, he very much loved to learn, but he didn't like being taught. <laughs> I thought that captured something, certainly in me, and uh, is a theme of didactic teaching. But yet we have to say that there's nothing special or unique about psychoanalytic or didactic teaching. In fact, frequently it's combined with teaching non-analysts in the same courses, and there's very little in the didactic program, and maybe different in case conferences, 
but in the rest of the didactic program that's unique to the psychoanalytic situation. There is an interesting, but I think unimportant dialogue in literature about whether or not candidates should sit in on courses taught by their analysts. And I have views on that, I'm happy to share them with you. But that's, it, you have to press to get to something special about psychoanalytic didactic teaching. The second pillar is personal analysis. Certainly the most unique component of candidacy, except as I said earlier, there's an argument about whether it should be a component at all. As you know, the French, for example, and many argue everyone, should separate personal analysis from training experiences, and they should have nothing to do with each other. Many have argued that a training analysis should be no different than any other personal analysis, and should be replaced by a personal analysis. So many have argued this that one might suspect there's something they're arguing against. My own view is that a training analysis is like any other analysis, in that it is absolutely unique. Every analysis is unique. And the special personal interests or values or ideas or uh, uh, careers of the analyst and the patient are always relevant insofar as how they match or don't match each other. Every analysis is influenced by characteristics that are shared or are different. Gender, ethnicity, language, religion, politics, aesthetics, temperament, cognitive style, social class are examples of characteristics that are always either the same or different and either way become relevant in the analytic process. Career choice is another one of that series. It's hard for me to imagine that you might have exactly the same career goals in mind as your analysis and, and that would never come up in the course of an analysis. How could you avoid such a thing? If the analyst and analysis and are pursuing totally different careers, that's gonna come up as well. Problems emerge if there's some reason for denying the relevance of that. If it's never mentioned, if the patient and analyst never mention that they both spend 40 hours a week of their lives sitting behind a couch while someone else is lying on it. That would be pretty strange. Um, I believe that the avoidance of this subject would be extremely unanalytic. Worst of all, of course, would be the conscious pretense of avoiding it. And I think anyone who um, uh, decides this is gonna be a personal analysis and therefore we won't discuss the fact that the analysis end is going to grow up to be in the same career that I'm in now and will be colleagues for the rest of our lives isn't doing an analysis. They're doing something else. Uh, so I don't think it's possible to analyze a candidate in a non-training analysis. Because if you're both analysts, there are gonna be special features to that relationship. But that's not what we're here to talk about. So having put in that little advertisement, I'm gonna go on to talk about supervision, but this is a good point for me to stop for a second and for all of you to say something. Remember, CME credit. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm interested to hear more about your idea of the, super, the supervisor-supervising relationship being able to be reformed into a good relationship, no matter what. Right. And if you have any thoughts about uh, what might make that impossible. You know, impossible. Right, in situations in which that it would be best to not continue that relationship. Right. Um, you I'm going to be... Your question. Yes, I'm sorry. I have to repeat your question. <laughs> and the question was, what would be the situations in which transforming a poor relationship into a better one is not possible? What would be the characteristics that would do that? I'm gonna be talking about how to do it. I wasn't planning to talk about what would make it impossible, I guess for obvious reasons. That would give you all an excuse to get up and leave the room. Um, in thinking about it, I would say that there are times when the appropriate thing to do in supervision is to end it and get a new supervisor or supervisee relationship because it is, or it seems to be, so formidable. I think they're relatively rare. Um, 
I would say the most common reason would be the extreme rigidity of the supervisor. Um, the rigidity of the supervisee is a challenge for supervision. And the supervisor is supposed to know how to deal with that. But the rigidity of the supervisor is more difficult to treat because they're older and they're more rigid and uh, they often are, um, have a positive narcissistic investment in their rigidity. There's only one right way to do it. I know what that way is and you're gonna learn my way or else. That's not a good supervisory stance. And it can be around trivial things. You know, uh, I, I conducted one of these two-day clinical conferences, uh, what is today, Wednesday and Thursday. And a gifted candidate presented a fascinating case and the candidate told us that it was her style to type during each session with a keyboard on her lap, taking verbatim notes of the uh, material. Was anyone there? It was a fascinating presentation. You should have been there. Would have been better than this. You're making a mistake. Um, but there were several people in the room who were so uh, disturbed by this breach of what they thought to be appropriate behavior on the part of the analyst that they couldn't hear the second sentence. They wanted her to shut off her typewriter. They didn't care about what else was happening. And it was a very interesting case in which her typing was relevant to understanding the clinical material. In fact, in my opinion, central to understanding it. And our business is understanding. And to have a judgmental attitude that it's evil precludes, precludes inquiry. And um, so that can be a problem. And that happens sometimes. Um, fortunately, it is much less expensive, I don't mean money, to change supervisors than to change analysts. So we should have an open way of doing that. My own administrative pedagogic view is a supervisee should always have the right to change a supervisor once. I get a little nervous when the same supervisee wants to change a supervisor the second time. <laughs> and I get judgmental the third time. <laughs> but that's just personal style. I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. Anyone else? Something else? We'll give another credit. <laughs> Won't we? See? Sure. Yes? I'm just curious about your thoughts about an analysand going to the analyst's class or presentation. Right. I mentioned that in passing. Uh, many people. Repeat uh, question. Some people don't learn easily, <laughs> and you have to patiently remind them, trying not to embarrass or humiliate them in the process, especially <laughs> I'm wondering if. <laughs> the question was, what are my views about a candidate going to a class that's conducted by the candidate's analyst? A class or something else you said? Presentation. Presentation. Um, it, it was long a common custom that candidates would not attend classes or other activities conducted by their own analyst. And it was part of the principle of anonymity. If you saw your analyst outside of the office, it would destroy the transference or the ability to uh, do a, a pristine, pure inquiry into the origins of uh, the patient's experience of the analyst. Uh, my own view is that there's no way to prevent those experiences, particularly in a psychoanalytic institute or community. We're just too small a town to not know or see. And I'm fairly visible. I don't know that I've ever had a patient who had no knowledge of my life outside of the office. Furthermore, with the availability of Google, half my patients know more about my life than I do because I've forgotten it and it's permanently remembered and I'm a Luddite so I don't know how to Google and they all do and they come in and remind me, but how come you said in 2001 in that talk you gave that I saw yesterday, blah, 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 and you're saying the opposite today. And I don't remember the talk or what I said or what. Um, I think that for the analyst 
to change his or her behavior because the other person involved is a patient is a countertransference enactment. And the metaphor I use, if you're walking down the street and you see your patient walking towards you and you cross the street, that's a countertransference enactment. But what isn't realized with that metaphor that I emphasize, it doesn't make any difference where you cross the street to be on the opposite side or the same side. Either way, it's a countertransference enactment. So if you arrange to speak uh, or teach because your candidate will be in the class, that's obviously a countertransference enactment. But if you avoid it or tell your candidate to stay away, that's also a countertransference enactment. And our general principle of psychoanalysis is when we are um, motivated to an enactment, we stop and try to understand it. We don't not do it or do it. We understand what it means. And then we act accordingly. So for me, it, I would never ask a candidate not to or suggest that a candidate attend a class or something that I was teaching. And I've had candidates, patients make both decisions. I would um, sometimes um, be concerned that they may be wasting time, <laughs> but we waste lots of time in life. Yes? Um, I, um, I wonder if you've got uh, thoughts about something in terms of selecting a supervisor. Um, at, at my institute, I was pretty free to pick whoever I wanted for my supervisor. And uh, I also knew the theoretical orientations most of them worked from. I mean, in general. Um, and um, I think that um, I've had two, two ways of thinking about it. One is that, I, I, and, and this is something I've, I've read about too, it's not just original with me, but that uh, it doesn't matter what point, what theoretical point of view your supervisor works from. If you get someone who's um, uh, senior, experienced, seasoned, let's use the word seasoned. Old. Yeah, as a, <laughs> but one can be old and not seasoned, you know. So someone who's like experienced and thoughtful, someone, you know, and usually you get to know who the people are by just being around in the uh, in the institute. But that um, that, that picking a, a supervisor, that uh, getting someone who's seasoned, experienced, and um, uh, able to think clinically, it almost doesn't matter where they're coming from theoretically they're going to be helpful to you as a supervisor. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts about that. Right. The question, uh, see? The, the question was, any thought or suggestion about selecting supervisors if you have a choice, not everyone does, and particularly around the issue of their theoretical orientation or approach. I would say more important than their theoretical orientation is their flexibility and their uh, understanding that the appropriate place for theory in supervision as in clinical work is in the back of one's mind. Supervision is not a place to teach a theory of technique, although a supervisor always has a theory of technique and it will influence what they say. But somebody listening, such as a supervisee, should not be aware of this person is a Kleinian with a touch of Bion and a little bit of Winnicott added on to sprinkle. This person, the, ideally, the supervisee would feel, boy, that was fascinating thinking about the patient that way. I never would have thought of that. And then a wise elder statesman would say, that's Winnicottian thinking there. You, I can see it. Uh, so you want a supervisor who's experience near and focused on the clinical experience of the patient and supervisee and not burdened by a theory in the front of his or her mind. I think you also want an array of supervisors. The greatest way to have autonomy is to have teachers who differ with each other. If all of your supervisors think the same thing, you're less likely to free yourself from their influence. I think it's probably ideal if at least one of your three or four supervisors is outside the pale of your institute or your training program's dogma, whatever that might be. And that might be a Lacanian or a Kleinian or a Freudian or a whatever-ian. 
uh, rather than all be of the same cut. I think it's also probably a good idea to have supervisors of both genders because gender is important in psychoanalytic work and most of our candidates have one gender or another and so it's good if they have experiences and that's true these days by the way it's good if they have experiences with supervisors with different sense of sensibilities to the patient's experience so i think you want an array and i think one of the reasons for the array again is to free the supervisee from being too closely dependent on supervisor uh, dogma. Um, again, the slave with two masters is a free man. Okay, let me go on a bit. I'm almost up to the beginning of the paper. That's good. Um, supervision is part of a developmental process. We've all had teachers and supervisors. We had parents. Most of us, by the time we get to be a candidate, have been weaned have been toilet trained, have learned to speak our native language, went to school, had a teacher, uh, learned to read, uh, have had mentors in our careers, et cetera, et cetera. Notice that each of these processes have two goals. One is mastering some skill or ability, whether it be important things like toilet training and uh, weaning or trivial things like calculus or uh, how to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But the second goal is to achieve autonomy and separation, to be independent in those activities. Few of us require a partner at this point in our lives for those several activities. Supervision similarly has the two goals. And a good supervisee not only acquires the supervisor's skills, but acquires the capacity to maintain and further develop those skills on separating from the supervisor. You want someone who is uh, able to surpass the supervisor. A good teacher really shows pride in the student who ends up better than the teacher, who's able to use what the teacher taught in order to grow and learn and teach the teacher in the end. Um, there's a famous interchange uh, that uh, Freud was involved in where uh, the, the punchline, I won't bother with the whole story, is that a midget standing on the shoulders of a giant can see further than a giant. Now, in the original version of this, the response to that was yes, but not a flea in the hair of an astronomer. And you want to be a midget standing on the shoulders of your supervisor giant but you want to be careful not to be a flea in the hair of your supervisor astronomer, if you follow that metaphor. Um, there is, however, something fairly unique about supervision and psychomotic training compared to all these other experiences I talked about in learning, which is the thing, the skill that's being learned is a very good model for the educational context. That is to say, you can learn to do calculus or to speak French or to um, uh, be a surgeon. But the educational transaction is not a mirror of the thing you're learning to do. But supervision is a pretty good mirror for psychoanalytic treatment. And therefore, the supervisory situation provides unusually rich opportunities for what we've come to call the parallel process that can go on. And we've all, there's much interesting literature going back to Harold Searles and Jack Arlo and other brilliant leaders in our field about the use of supervision as a model that reflects what's going on in the treatment. And so that's interesting. In the, case that I mentioned that I, that I noticed the slip, it was a slip, that I discussed at the case conference two days ago, uh, I started the conference by commenting on what was left out of the presenter's present, very good, rich presentation, but certain very interesting details weren't mentioned, like the first decade of the patient's life or his sexual behavior. It was interesting. 
a central theme in the discussion became how the typing forced attention to the surface of the material and therefore it distracted attention away from what wasn't being said. Now, if you're an analyst, you're not only interested in what's said, you're very interested in what isn't said. But you can't listen to what isn't said if you're overwhelmingly attentive to what is said. Now, I've used that argument with patients who claim that I wasn't listening to them. And I said, I'm an analyst. I don't listen to everything you say because I have to think. And when I'm thinking, my mind wanders. And you want my mind to wander because you don't want me just to reflect what you said. To which my sophisticated patient replied, but you weren't listening. <laughs> it was a good line, though. I thought I liked it. I liked it. I've already mentioned how supervision continues throughout one's career. Uh, we don't often think of that when we're candidates, but you're, this is the beginning of a lifelong theme in what you're going to be doing, and a richly rewarding theme. Psychoanalysis is an extraordinarily lonely profession. Most people in healthcare, doc, physicians, psychologists, spend a lot of time with each other. What do you do when you're a physician? You have coffee with other people. <laughs> the nurse on the ward, your colleague, the radiologist, the pathologist, et cetera. You're a psychologist, you present results, you listen to results, you go to case conferences. You're an analyst, you sit in your office, and you're forbidden to talk to your patients about anything except what's relevant to the treatment. You can't say, I saw a great television program yesterday. That's always the wrong thing to say. <laughs> you're very, it's a very lonely career. And there are various ways of dealing with that, but one way of dealing with that, as I've said, is lifelong supervisory experiences. And one reason, uh, for some of you, that you probably haven't been at many meetings of the American Psychoanalytic Association. This, is this your first for anyone? A couple people, yeah. One of the astonishing things when you come to this is how can so many growing people spend so much time with each other in a room talking about something that makes so little difference to anybody? I often would sit around committee rooms where we would discuss the budget, and we'd discuss whether or not to spend $1,000. And it would take an hour and a half, and I'd count the people in the room, I'd know roughly what their hourly fee was, and I'd realize that we cost $4,000 to decide whether or not to spend 1,000. What kind of craziness is that? But then you realize when people are lonely, they love these activities. And it's wonderful to go to a committee and decide whether to have caffeine-free coffee or coffee at the next meeting, because you can all talk with each other, and you can joke, and you can relax, and you can be free. But you can't do that in your office. And we spend a lot of time in our offices where we're inhibited in that regard. So supervision becomes important for that. There's usually a much more relaxed atmosphere in a good supervisory relationship than in a clinical situation. In fact, that aspect of a supervisory relationship may have an important parallel process significance for the clinical experience. I'm keeping going back because it's fresh in my mind and my memory gets more and more condensed in its capacity. But my experience with this case conference I was talking about, the room was loose and comfortable. There was a lot of sexual material and we got, the, the group was talking dirty by the end of the first two hours. It was sort of fun. But the clinical sessions were pristine and pure, and they were using technical language for sexual activities of various kinds. At one critical point, the patient said, my wife pleasured me. No one asked, the, the analyst didn't ask, what do you mean? I could think of more than one way to get pleasured. Um, so we talked about how to get the atmosphere of the group into the consultation room with the patient. How to make it looser and freer to talk about such things. That goes on in supervision as well. And a good supervisor has an atmosphere which can be as important an educational issue as the content of what's said for the supervisee. Okay. One way of thinking about the total educational experience is that the didactic curriculum is designed to prepare the candidate for supervision. So what you should learn in your courses is how to talk to your supervisor. To acquaint the candidate with the theories and concepts he or she is likely to encounter in supervision. 
Supervision, in turn, is to facilitate the candidate's conduct of the analysis, to assist in translating the theories and concepts of the curriculum to the consultation room, to facilitate their positive impact, and to protect from their negative impact. This goal of supervision is to help the candidate become the best analyst he or she can be, not a perfect analyst. There is no such thing as a perfect analyst nor even the best analyst of a given school. Because if you're an analyst of a given school, you're not a good analyst. Nor even the best analyst for this particular patient. Because that's too narrow a goal for supervision. That's like learning how to wet your bed, how not to wet your bed tonight. That's not enough. Because it should be not only to be a better analyst for this patient, but to, after the supervision is over, be a better analyst for every patient. So the supervisor has a responsibility of generalizing as well as teaching about the clinical process. The more specific goals of supervision vary depending on the patient, the supervisee, the stage and nature of the therapy, the fit of those three, and the stage of the therapist's professional development. When the therapist is inexperienced, perhaps a beginning psychiatry resident or a psychology fellow, the primary focus of supervision is often the safety of the patient and the helpfulness of the treatment. This is also common if the patient has a dangerous psychiatric illness, perhaps marked by suicidality or impulsive destructive behavior. However, these factors, a professional novice a seriously ill patient, troublesome behavior, are all relatively unlikely in the psychoanalytic training situation. I did what I'm sure many of you do, which is last night I looked through this because I knew I was gonna be talking today, and I wanted to remember what I'd written and be able to say it freshly, and I didn't like that sentence. I thought it was wrong. And I thought it was wrong because although I say it's unlikely, a variant of it is likely which is the pseudo-naivety of the psychoanalytic candidate, who in order to play it safe, presents himself or herself to the supervisor and says, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know anything about this, I've never done this before, uh, am I supposed to walk in the room and open the door or not open the, often we have also on concrete things. Do I hand the patient the bill or mail it to them? Do I put a little paper dowly on top of, dowly, uh, do I, what word do I want? Doily. Doily, on top of the pillow or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I call that a pseudo naivete, in which the candidate's trying to assert that I know nothing at all, so I'm not to be blamed. Um, I think it's almost never true for a psychoanalytic candidate. They couldn't have gotten this far. A second focus of supervision may be the teaching of a model or method of therapy. In some ways, this recalls the link between supervision and the didactic curriculum. It's a necessary theme of supervision of precisely defined therapies, those that have or could have a how to do it manual. And as a standard form of supervision in cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy, uh, it was mentioned that I'm on the editorial board of the American Journal of Psychiatry and I handle stuff in this area, as you might imagine. And we have an interesting paper right now, a randomized controlled trial with fancy and sophisticated statistics by a top-notch group comparing two treatments. That's standard. What are the two treatments? One of them is psychoanalytic psychotherapy conducted with a manual, and the other is psychoanalytic psychotherapy free flow, no manual. I think that's a very interesting theoretical model. Um, I won't tell you what the results are because I, I want you to subscribe to our journal. We live off the income. But it was a very interesting idea to explore that. It's also found in some forms of psychodynamic psychotherapy, but less common than in the more structured therapies. The status in psychoanalytic training is more controversial. There's a spectrum. There are supervisors at one end who believe there's certain aspects of psychoanalysis that can be taught and learned just like any other structured therapy. Uh, how you tell the patient the basic rule. There are people who've written articles with verbatim sentences that you use. How you manage the arrangements for the frame 
the regularity of the sessions, the rules about charging for missed sessions, the handling of cancellations or lateness or uh, dealing with how to, how to deal with the dream. What are the things you might explore? And they, they say, you gotta learn the, you gotta learn the rules. Um, uh, a brilliant member of our profession has argued that a real analysis begins when you throw away the book. Now, I had to discuss that paper when it was first presented, and I loved, not uncommonly, loved my discussion even more than the paper, it was a good paper. I said, it's true that a real analysis begins when you throw away the book, but first you have to read the book. <laughs> and this is reading the book, learning these rules. Some supervisors emphasize that aspect of supervision, and there's a fair amount of didactic instruction in their supervision. At the other end of the spectrum are the supervisors who view their role as aiding the development of the candidate's natural style. They don't want to instruct the candidate on how to do something that the candidate never did before, but rather want to learn and explore with the candidate what the latter's spontaneous responses and behaviors are and explore whether they enrich or impede the analytic process. They see supervision as very much technically similar to analytic treatment where you don't tell the patient what to do, but you explore their resistances and enhance their awareness of their spontaneous behaviors and explore how adaptive or maladaptive they might be. Freud discusses the analogous difference in approach by therapists in his famous paper on psychotherapy. He quotes Leonardo da Vinci, who compares painting, where you simply apply a color to a colorless canvas you start with the blank and you add something to it, which to sculpt, he compares that to sculpture, where you start with a block of stone, which has a statue inside of it, and you chip away the excrescences to expose the internal statue. He says psychoanalysis is more like sculpture, whereas other therapies are more like painting. That in psychoanalysis, you don't add something, you chip away what conceals something which is within. Psycholytic supervision presents the same choices. On the one hand, the supervisor who views the candidate as a blank cabinet and tries to create a psychoanalyst by instruction, and on the other hand, the supervisor who views the candidate as an embryonic analyst who requires shaping and polishing in order to lead to an analyst who's unequivocally the same person as the candidate who first started but whose perceptions and responses have been refined and developed and shaped by his analytic and supervisory experience. Let me stop again. I'm stopping when I'm, th yes, thank you. Yes, um, how does, could you say a bit more about supervision following the model of analytic treatment where the supervisor doesn't tell the supervisee what to do. Uh, I mean, could you talk some more about how the supervisee-supervisor relationship is supposed to uh, uh, follow the model of treatment? Yes, it's the way I like to work, so I'm, that's a, the, sorry. <laughs> But I'm getting better. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, twice I didn't, then I did, and then I forgot, but I picked it up myself. We're very proud. <laughs> I thought I was getting an award. I may, I may just end up getting allowed to supervise after this. <laughs> um, the question was, could I comment on the method of supervision in which you don't instruct the candidate on how to do something but just try to work with the candidate's own experience. It's the way I usually work. If the candidate, the supervisee, has a certain level of clinical competence. So I usually start supervision. My, my usual pattern with supervision is my first session is not about the patient. It's about the supervisee. And I take a supervisory history. What have been your earlier experiences in learning? What are your style? Why did you pick me? That's always very interesting. Uh, their fantasy about what's going to happen in the supervision, and um, who have been your other supervisors, and what you like and what you didn't like, what did they miss, what do you want to get in this supervisory experience, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll ask them to tell me about the patient they want to present. 
but I'll be listening a little bit to learn about the patient, but more to learn how they think about a patient. So some people will start by telling you, well, uh, this is a 47-year-old married Catholic man with three children who's been a lawyer for the last seven, you know, that style of starting. Other people will say, ever since I met this man, I've had a funny feeling in my stomach. That's another way of presenting, it's quite different than the first way. Other people will say, I'm really in trouble here because for the last week, this patient has been insisting blah, 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 blah. And I want to know how they think and how they put their data together and what they're thinking about. And I'll usually start supervision by commenting on the way they're presenting and on the way they're formulating and searching for alternate formulations. The model I use explicitly in the modern world, everyone knows this model better than I do, is I'm trying to give you more icons on your internal uh, screen for choices when you either think about or decide what to do with your patient. That my goal in supervision is to increase your range of choices and explore with you why you've selected the ones you've selected. That's pretty much the way I think about treatment also, but I don't usually say that so explicitly to a patient in treatment. Sometimes I do. Yes? One of the things that's coming to my mind as you're speaking relates uh, to the six-year-old boy saying, I don't like to be taught, and also your reaction to being um, reminded internally or externally about what you're forgetting is the humbling experience of coming up against what I don't know over and over again. And I could say humiliating or embarrassing experience, but that, that coming to terms with my non-knowing and the painfulness of that. I think with some supervisors, the way they handle it is, is remarkable in terms of my acceptance of that in myself. And with some, I feel less able to be vulnerable or open about my learning. So uh, I was hoping you would speak to that component too. Is that I, I find that really remarkable in, in the different supervisions I've had. Okay, that was a comment as much as a question. <laughs> yeah. And it was that she wants me to expand on the humbling experience of coming up with what you don't know in a supervisory relationship. <laughs> and implicitly, I think she was commenting on the variety of ways in which supervisors handle that experience and whether it, it results in a narcissistic wound that stops you from listening or a, an ability to grow and be enhanced. My own life experience is that for the first half of my life, I learned more and more and more and I got smarter and smarter and smarter until I knew everything. And then I've forgotten more and more and more and gotten dumber and dumber and dumber. And now there's lots I don't know. And I think I'm a better supervisor now because I don't think it's good for the supervisor to be too smart. Uh, I think it's good for the supervisor to share with the candidate the delight and enjoyment of not knowing and exploring and thinking and speculating and wondering and uh, just as it's good for the therapist to share that experience with the patient. I think the therapist who fully understands the patient, first of all, he's a fool if he thinks he does. Secondly, it's bad for the treatment. Um, the uh, supervisory experience, the good experience, is one of jointly exploring and discovering rather than of being told what you don't know. Now, again, at the beginning, and for certain critical points where there's danger, that may not be totally true. So if a first year resident tells me that the patient was talking about suicide and said that uh, he bought a gun and some pills and couldn't decide which one to use and was gonna go home and make the decision, and the resident says, well, I'll see you next Thursday, I would intervene. <laughs> I wouldn't say what comes to your mind about that. Um, but that's not a candidate issue very often. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Um, but the supervisory experience, ideally like the clinical experience, is joint discovery. And the fun of not knowing should replace the pain 
of confronting what one doesn't know. The usual stance, I believe there's a normal developmental process of becoming a dynamic therapist. And you see it more in residents maybe, but sometimes in candidates as well. Stage one is you have no idea what's going on and you're panicked and terrified. Stage two is you have a theory, somebody gave you a lecture, you read a paper by Freud or somebody else, and suddenly you see conflict, defense, unconscious, and it's all clear, you understand what's going on and you know what to say. Stage three is you read a few more papers and you see five different things and suddenly you see all kinds of things are going on and you don't know which one to talk about or whether to keep silent and talk about the other. And you have as, almost as much confusion as in stage one, but it's a different kind where there are multiple possibilities and you don't know which way to go. And um, I'm not sure there is a stage four. <laughs> I think stage four is becoming more comfortable with stage three and recognizing that's life. Life is like that. And I think the supervisor's job is to help you get from stage one to stage two. That's important. And then to help you be comfortable in stage three rather than needing to fix on something. I believe the supervisor with a favorite beloved theory, the Winnicottian or Bionian or Kleinian or Freudian or Anna Freudian or Sullivanian or Lacanian or running out of, of adjectives, is trying to get you to pick one of those possibilities and stick to it. And I believe better than that is to help you see which one you're normally reflexly, unconsciously selecting and explore with you why you're selecting that one and to keep you optimum, optimally uncertain. That's not certain, it's not totally confused, but optimally uncertain as you conduct the process. I think that may respond to your question. Anybody else? You're pretty good, but not that good in terms of asking. I'm gonna give the group a B plus needs work. Yes. It's more it's more common, but I'm just thinking about what you're saying is how similar the analytic and the supervisory experience is, except the supervisory experience can be fun also and more human for both part you know, parties to it. It's more collegial. Although it's like a wise elder is with it, you know, a versioning, hopefully wise, you know, analyst to be. And, and so it's like, it, ideally, I think it could be collaborative. You know, it's like the supervisor who can learn from the supervisee as well as, you know, like that would be an ideal thing. So of course, more learning is going in one direction, but the openness from the supervisor. That could be very, I don't know, refreshing to the supervisee. That was a comment. I think most of you probably heard it. The theme was that the supervisory process can be more collegial, open, and comfortable and enjoyable, was implied, I think, because of the lack of um, uh, structured asymmetry that is more common in the analytic relationship um, opens up a universe that I think will defer for right now at least. Let me go on. What do we hit? When do we turn we into have pumpkins? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ha ha ha. Um, Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. What, um, since we're on two minutes, uh, yeah, my question would you, is there one thing you, or, or something you could say to recommend to supervisees to how to, how to or how not to prepare to meet with your supervisors? Just thinking about the name of this, like care and meeting with supervisors. Um, right. Okay, I'm going to obviously not talk about everything that came to my mind. Um, I give a piece of advice in the next section that I won't read, which is if your supervisor's focus narrow and has a school and they're committed to it, learn that school with the supervisor. That can be fascinating and important and interesting. And don't try to convert 
a narrow one school supervisor into a broad, flexible, you can't do that. You don't have enough of a therapeutic alliance. Learn what you can learn from somebody rather than try to turn them into the ideal teacher for you. You'll have other supervisors and other experiences. And if you don't learn anything, you're a bad student. Don't, don't blame the supervisor for not learning. The supervisor can be stupid and narrow-minded, but it's almost certain that there's something they know that you don't. And it's your job to find that and learn it while you're with that supervisee. The next section I'm going to skip to, though, quickly, I am, it's an answer to the question that was just asked, which is entitled, Presenting the Case. There's no single or correct way to present clinical material to a supervisor. The most basic principle, which I urge you to, is discuss how you're going to present with the supervisor. A corollary is that if the supervision seems to be hung up or in trouble or sta static or boring, discuss whether you might switch to another way of presenting to the supervisor. The first question usually is, what kind of record does the candidate make of the clinical material? There are many possibilities. There's no right way. Each one has advantages and disadvantages. One can have a recording of the session, but there's no way you can listen to four hours of recording in a 45 minute or hour supervision. And that excludes what isn't on the surface. I remember my comment earlier about the person who typed each session. One can take written verbatim notes during the session. That allows the supervisee to add additional thoughts remembered during the supervisory process, and I believe that's very important. One can make notes after the session. That's probably the most common way. This requires what often isn't done, which is reserving time after the session to make the notes. If you do it at the end of the day, you won't have good notes and you won't know what happened. Um, ideally, whatever the record is should never be read to the supervisor during the supervisory session. I see eyebrows going up. I'm sure some of you do read. I know some of my supervisees try to read. I think the right way to do it is that your notes or record are an aid to your memory, but they're not the data. And you're going to remember the session in supervision and create a new entity, a kind of image of the session, which will be much richer in meaning than the verbatim notes <coughs> because it will include what you remember. It will include obvious lacunae of what you forgot. It will include your thoughts afterwards while talking to the supervisor, your interpolations and extrapolations from the material. So you'll create an entity in the supervision. The notes are one of, but not the only contribution to that entity. And what is supervised is that entity. That becomes more valuable as a guide to your experience of the patient and the treatment than the verbatim notes might be. Um, one can make notes. <coughs> uh, at times, the unit discussed in supervision is more than a session, particularly if there's been a break in the continuity of the supervision. There was a month <laughs> off in August or because of Christmas or something like that. I always tell supervisees what is most often deleted, but is of particular importance to us. I want to know what happened in the first 60 seconds of contact, in the waiting room, or on the way out the door. I want to know every discussion about the administration of the process, scheduling, money, cancellations, etc. I want to know every joke. I want to know every wisecrack. I want to know every metaphor that's used. I want dreams as close to verbatim as possible, and I'll usually encourage supervisees to take verbatim notes of dreams, because it's hard to remember what is meaningless, and at the time you hear the dream, it doesn't yet have meaning, and therefore you're likely to lose pieces of it that will only uh, become richer as the meaning occurs. I want to know transitions or interruptions, shifts in the material. The, con con the connections between different comments. Once again, you want these to be as verbatim as possible. Supervisory sessions, by the way, always have more going on than the discussion of the clinical material. 
there's usually a personal relationship that develops between the supervisor and supervisee. The supervisor becomes a mentor and career counselor that the personal analyst isn't. And therefore, there'll be talk about, I'm getting a new job or I'm being interviewed. There'll be talk about personal life. I'm supervising a very gifted senior resident at the moment who's a, 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 a talented psychotherapist, a young woman uh, embedded in her career, and she has four children under the age of eight at home. And that can be a heavy burden. And she's come in the office occasionally and commented on the fact three of the four children have bad colds or the flu and they're all home and she didn't know whether she'd get to the session or not. Stuff. That's not irrelevant to the supervision. That's central to the supervision. And we've had very rich discussions of the parallel process. She's treating a young career woman who's torn between uh, her career and her personal life and whether she should get married or not and whether it will interfere with her career. And my patient is uh, struggling to contain herself from giving very good advice to her patient about what she should do and shouldn't do, which depends heavily on how the kids are that morning when she goes to the session with the patient or comes to see me. I have a whole session I'm not going to talk about because my time is up, uh, our time is up, about evaluation. But I'll say this, evaluation is central to a good supervision. It should be going on constantly. If the supervisor isn't evaluating you, they're a lousy teacher. You want the evaluation to be 100% shared in detail between the supervisor and the supervisee. Most of the anxiety occurs around reporting the evaluation to some other authority, the institute or somebody like that. However, the institute has to have some evaluation and there's no good way to do it. The courses aren't that important. You don't get anything. You used to get evaluations from the personal analyst, but pretty much there's a consensus that's unethical. You can do an external evaluation in certification or in exams for graduation, but most of us find the validity of those seriously questionable. And most people think the best evaluator is a supervisor, except supervisors and supervisees are always worried that the evaluative process contaminates and interferes with the educational process. But once again, I think the evaluation should be constant and ongoing. I think if the supervisor has a view about the uh, quality of the supervisee's work that the supervisee is not aware of, it's a serious negative criticism of the supervision. There's nothing the supervisor should know about the supervisee that the supervisee doesn't know, the super doesn't have to agree with, but doesn't know the supervisor knows. My own preference is that the supervisor prepares an evaluation periodically, once every six months, once every year, for the institute, that the supervisee reads it and comments on it in writing, and the two, the two go in together to the institute. So the institute authorities know what the supervisor thinks and the supervisee's view about what the supervisor thinks. And then they use that in making a decision. However, keep in mind that by the time you're at this stage in your career, the chances of the evaluations of supervisors leading to some dire negative consequence are very low. We're, we're not that kind of profession. In fact, in my opinion, too many people who enter our institutes graduate. It should be a smaller percentage that graduate, not a larger percentage. And evaluation processes don't represent, supervision evaluation doesn't represent the major barrier to entering the profession. But with that, I will stop. Thank you, Dr. Mike, so much. Wonderful.